Welcome to the Ship Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, August 5th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Jobs, jobs, jobs. That's the flavor of the day. Yep, we're going to get the July labor market report this morning. And uh, the plan is I'm going to break it live at the end of the show. So about the time I get to the end of what I've prepared, we should be about ready to get the jobs numbers. So we'll break those live. I think this is probably going to be viewed as one of the more significant labor market reports that we've gotten in a while, uh, given that you know there's a lot of talk about a recession. And of course, the labor market is the one thing that the this is not a recession people can point to. So uh, we'll see about that. We'll talk about the labor market here in a little bit. But uh, first, a couple of other things I want to touch on. Uh, of course, gold took a wild roller coaster ride this week. We got a pretty good rally in both the price of gold and silver after the Fed meeting last week. And of course, I talked about that extensively in the last show. So you can go back and listen to that if you missed it. But, you know, basically, I think a lot of people are starting to expect that we're close to the end of the Fed hiking cycle. Uh, you know, the economy is getting squishy. The GDP data says recession, even if the Biden administration says otherwise. And it just seems like this is about as far as the Fed is going to be able to go. But then several members of the Fed jawboned gold back down with a lot of tough talk. As Peter Schiff put it in his podcast, the messaging was basically, damn the recession, full ahead with rate hikes. Now, the question is, how long can the Fed keep this, you know, this tough guy act up? So, Neil Kashkari was the Fed guy that kind of got things started off over the weekend when he appeared on Face the Nation and said, quote, whether we are technically in a recession or not doesn't change my analysis. And he went on to say, we're going to do everything we can to avoid a recession, but we are committed to bringing inflation down and we are going to do what we need to do. Now, this is kind of significant because cash carry is typically one of the most dovish FOMC members. So, you know, to have him come out and, and uh, talk all tough guy, uh, it's, it's significant. So on Monday, we had more Fed members pile on, basically singing the same song. I think the most outspoken was San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. She said she was, quote, puzzled by bond market prices that reflect investor expectations for the central bank to shift to rate cuts in the first half of next year. She insisted that the central bank will keep raising rates and then hold them there for, quote, a long while. So we saw a big sell-off in gold and silver on Tuesday afternoon as the market digested all of this hawkish talk. But, you know, it's interesting because it was really just kind of a pause in the rally that started after the Fed meeting. Yesterday, gold climbed back and uh, it actually flirted with $1,800 an ounce. Now, the spot price fell just short at about $1,795, but gold futures actually closed above $1,800 yesterday. And uh, this morning, gold was down. It was down about 6 bucks, but it seemed to be gaining back a little speed. Uh, of course, I think whatever comes out of the jobs report is really going to have a big impact on how gold settles today. Now, there are a couple of factors that are driving uh, this little rally in gold. First, um, just a lot of safe haven buying. First, because of the recession fear. Um, and that's also dragging down the dollar, which of course tends to put some tailwinds behind precious metals. We're also seeing other central banks raising rates. Uh, the uh, Bank of England just raised its rate, I think, 50 basis points, which is like the biggest hike they've done in a long time. And so that's putting a little pressure on the dollar. And then we also have the, the geopolitical uncertainty with Nancy Pelosi tweaking Chinese sensibilities with her little jaunt over to Taiwan. So again, I'm sure we'll see some big moves today, one way or the, one way or the other, um, when the uh, labor market data comes out. So, a little side note: I mentioned Mary Daly. Did y'all see what she said about inflation? 
she was doing an interview, I think it was like streamed on Twitter, and she was asked whether she was personally experiencing the negative effects of inflation in the U.S. economy. Now, a sane, empathetic person would, you know, talk about how, yeah, I understand this is really tough on a lot of people, but, um, you know, she, apparently she's not an empathetic person because she said she does, in fact, not feel the pain of inflation anymore. Quote, I'm not immune to gas prices rising, food prices rising. I sometimes balk at the price of things, but I don't find myself in a space where I have to make trade-offs because I have enough, she said. Many, many Americans have enough, she added. Now, ain't that cute? I mean, that felt very much like a let them eat cake moment, right? I looked up this woman's net worth. It's like $68 million, and her paycheck is over $1,600 a day. So, yeah, she has enough. The problem with so many of these politicians and, and central bankers is they live in this little bubble of privilege. They have no clue what real life is like. You know, she went on and she tried to be sympathetic. She talked about how she knows some people do have it hard. But the best example she could come up with is people are having to downsize their vacation. Meanwhile, the average family is putting their freaking groceries on MasterCard. So, yeah, I don't have much good to say about Mary Daly. And that leads me to the next subject for today, the myth of the healthy consumer. So whenever these government people talk about how the economy is fine, it's strong, the, you know, it's got a good foundation, they bring up basically two things. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And the consumer is still spending money. They'll point to that and say, hey, you know, we can't really be having a problem in the economy because Americans are out there and they're still spending. They're going to restaurants and, and uh, you know, spending's not going down. Now, I've been saying the consumer really isn't healthy. I mean, yes, they are still spending, that's true, but they're digging a big old hole of debt to do it. Now, is that rational? Is it smart to use your credit card so that you can keep eating out? No. But most people, let's be honest, most people aren't really smart when it comes to money. And most people have really high time preferences in meaning they want it now. They want it here, they want it now. So, most people will do what they can do to keep on spending as much as they can, and then they'll worry about the consequences later. That's what high time preference means. Now, I've talked about real income several times on the show. Nominal wages are going up, so we're seeing wages balloon with inflation. But when you adjust wages for inflation, real wages are dropping. Real income is down about 1% on the year. So, you're able to buy, your buying power is 1% less than it was last year. So how are all of these healthy consumers spending money when their income is actually dropping in real terms? Well, they're running up debt at a dizzying pace, and that ain't healthy. So the New York Fed released its quarterly household debt report uh, last week, or this week, and total household debt increased by $312 billion in Q2. That puts household debt at a record $16.15 trillion, trillion with a T. Household debt has surged $2 trillion above pre-pandemic levels in 2019. Now, mortgage rates were a big driver in this overall increase in debt. Uh, mortgage rates shot up precipitously in Q2 as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to fight inflation. We've talked about the housing market quite a bit on the show as well. This pushed mortgage balances up by $207 billion in the last quarter. So now total outstanding mortgages are at $11.39 trillion. That was as of the end of June. So, you know, obviously mortgage debt is the biggest pile of debt that Americans have. Probably the, the least problematic. 
But the part of the report that really grabbed my attention was the huge increase in credit card debt. Credit card balances increased by $46 billion in the second quarter. Now, this is just credit cards. This this isn't all revolving credit. So when you get the consumer credit reports every month, they talk about revolving credit. So they lump in credit cards and uh, department store cards and, and other revolving balances. This is just your major credit cards, $46 billion uh, increase. Um, over the last year, credit card debt has exploded by 13%. That's the biggest increase in a year in over 20 years. Americans opened 233 million new credit card accounts in the second quarter. That was the largest number of new accounts opened in a single quarter since 2008. Now, what was happening in 2008? Yeah, the beginning of the Great Recession. Hmm. There was a Reuters article this week talking about how Gen Z and consumers with lower credit ratings are falling behind on credit card and auto loan bills, and they're accumulating credit card debt at a pace not seen since before the pandemic. Credit card balances for people ages 25 and younger rose 30% in the second quarter year on year. Now, I'd say that that's a canary in the coal mine. You know, the people who... um, have the lower incomes, they're going to be the ones that start running up the credit cards first, right? So that's what we're seeing. Young people, Gen Z, people with lower credit ratings, they're running up their debt at a faster pace. And I think that is kind of looking ahead to what's what's to come, right? Um, in other debt, let's see, auto loan balances, they were up um, along with uh, other balances. They have a category called other balances. This includes retail credit cards and other consumer loans. Um, So that was uh, the only debt category that didn't increase significantly was student loans, which of course makes sense because most people, um, most students are on summer break. So there's also a sign that consumers are starting to feel the strain of this increasing load of debt. A lot of people paid down their debt with stimulus money during the pandemic revolving credit card balances, um, so that includes credit cards and all of these other things. It was over a trillion dollars when the pandemic began, and it fell well below that level in 2020. There was an 11.2% drop in revolving credit um, debt through the pandemic. So that gave consumers some wiggle room, right? Now that wiggle room is getting a lot tighter. And um, while they're still low in historic terms, the share of current debt transitioning into delinquency increased modestly in all debt categories in the last quarter. According to the report, quote, we are seeing rising delinquencies among subprime and low income borrowers with rates approaching pre-pandemic levels. So again, canary in the coal mine. And even with the continuing moratoriums on foreclosures and you know, a bunch of mortgage forbearance programs that are still out there. You know, it's kind of weird that that stuff's still out there this far after the pandemic, but but it is. Nevertheless, the number of foreclosures are starting to creep up. So, you know, when you look at all of this, it's a little hard to swallow Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell's claim that households are in a very strong financial shape. No, they're not. (laughs) The big run-up in debt signals that Americans are struggling to make ends meet while prices are still rising, and they're buying, burying themselves in debt to keep their heads above water. You know, the stimulus checks are long gone. We're seeing a big depletion in savings. The saving rate is back down at levels we saw during the Great Recession. The average person has no choice but to pull out the plastic. And of course, whip out the plastic and charge it only works for so long, right? Those things have limits. So, as I mentioned earlier, the other data point that all of the this is not a recession people point to is jobs, jobs, jobs. Now, I'm going to grant you, the labor market really doesn't scream recession right now, but it is getting squishy. And as I've said over and over, the labor market is a lagging indicator. So, there are some signs of cracks, right? Job openings fell more than expected in June. According to the JOLTS job report, Uh, Job openings fell by 605,000 to 10.7 million as of June 30th. The forecast was for 11 million vacancies. 
Now, job openings are still at an elevated level. If you look at a graph, I'll put a graph on the show notes page. If you look at the graph, you can see that they're still pretty high, but it also looks like it's falling off a cliff, to be honest. And then for some anecdotal evidence, this week, Walmart announced layoffs in its corporate office. It will let go hundreds of corporate employees at divisions related to merchandising, global technology, and real estate. So again, canary in the coal mine. We're starting to see this pressure in retail, and uh, we're starting to see the layoffs. You know, there's an interesting dynamic at play in the labor market, and I think it's creating a bit of an illusion. Now, think about how things have played out. Government shut down the economy. Millions and millions of people lost their job. Then we saw this huge surge in job openings as the economy opened up. People went back to work. The unemployment level dropped. Here's the thing. A lot of people never went back to work. I think a lot of people just retired if they had the ability. I think some people just decided, I don't need to work. I'll go live with mom. So the labor participation rate is really low. It's at 62.2%. That created an extremely tight labor market. A lot of people not coming back to work, people retiring. Um, you know, the economy's trying to open up. So now, even with the, with the economic slowdown clearly underway, it will take a while for the labor market to loosen up. But I think that's what's happening. You can see it in the declining number of job openings. And I think as this recession goes on, you'll see the trend accelerate as economic realities begin to drag on businesses. And then as those job openings decline, then you'll start the next step is the layoffs. So I, I don't know what will happen then. I guess maybe the uh, Biden administration will have to redefine the word layoff. Anyway, I, I think I said last week, you know, companies don't immediately lay people off when the economy slows down. Layoff starts when the slowdown becomes obvious. So you look at Walmart, you know, they've seen this decline in their sales. They're projecting uh, 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 softer revenues in the future. So now they're doing layoffs. You're going to see that accelerate as this recession goes on. So I think at this point, the July data has come out. So let me pause and uh, check out, see what the news is. And I'll be right back in a few. All right, I'm back. So the first thing I did was I looked at the price of gold. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at gold and then I'm going to predict whether this was perceived as a good job report or a bad job report. And uh, the price of gold was down $16.70. And um, so I thought, oh, must have been a pretty good payroll report, and it was. We had a uh, an addition of 528,000 jobs in July. I think that was more than expected. And the unemployment rate actually dropped to 3.5%. Um, and we saw some increase in average hourly earnings. So pretty big jump in the number of jobs, despite all of the uh, past weeks of increasing uh, weekly jobless claims. So very interesting. So uh, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, the first thing you make of it is that this is going to give more room for the White House and the Fed and everybody to spend, oh, the economy is great. And, you know, there's no recession. Don't worry. People are still working. I still don't buy it. Um, again, Labor is a lagging indicator. I'm surprised. I'm not going to lie. I am a bit surprised that um, it was this good. I figured it would be equal and maybe a little softer than expected. But um, we'll see th how things play out as we get into the next month. We do not have a Fed meeting in August, so we have to go to September. So there's a lot of time for the Fed to digest the data. But um, probably not going to be a good day for gold and silver uh, given the jobs report, because what people are going to expect is that, oh, the economy's fine. We can handle more rate hikes. Uh, we got to get inflation under control. So we'll have to wait and see. The big number, of course, is going to be what do we get when we get the uh, the CPI data for last month? And I think it's pretty obvious that's going to be uh, a little bit lower with the drop in gasoline prices that we've seen over the last month. So uh, that could give the Fed some wiggle room to maybe not tighten. But but right now, everybody's thinking, yeah, Fed's talking tough. They're going to tighten. Jobs are fine. The economy's fine. Literally the only data point that says the economy's fine. But, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind, this stuff plays out very slowly. So, um, 
we'll see how things go. And I'm sure that our uh, the guy that does technical analysis for us, I'm sure that he'll dig into uh, these jobs numbers and, and we'll get a little bit better idea of what it's really saying. So stay tuned next week. We'll kind of dig into it. I'm sure Peter will have some things to say about it over the weekend. Um, at this point, that's all I've really got to say. But I do want to, as always, encourage you to take a moment and talk to a shift gold precious metal specialist. Um, you know, these guys might have a good buying opportunity here if, if gold drops a bunch uh, because everybody thinks the economy's fine. So um, give them a call, 1 888 Gold 160, or you can shoot them an email info at shiftgold.com, or you can just go to shiftgold.com, go to the Getting Started tab, and you can chat with a precious metal specialist right there on the website. And uh, again, you know, they'll look at help you look at your portfolio, your investment strategy, your goals, and uh, see how precious metals can fit into your investment strategy. With that, that is a gold wrap for this week. As always, you can keep up with all of these stories and more throughout the week over at shiftgold.com slash news. If you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap Podcast on Apple Podcasts, we're on Stitcher, uh, on the uh, YouTube. You can check all of the links out to those things on the show notes page. As always, you are welcome to shoot me an email, M-M-A-H-A-R-R-E-Y at shipgold.com, mmahary at shipgold.com. Love to hear from folks. And... Um, With that, we're going to wrap it up. I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. And I will talk to you all next week.